For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. Welcome to the Antiquities Travel Guide, a helping hand for visiting historic places. Follow us to different countries as we search for ancient artifacts. If you too wish to explore the ancient past through travel, we'll help you plan where to go, what to see, and how best to enjoy what you encounter. In this series of the ATG, you can accompany Natalie and me on our trek through Egypt, homeland of the ancient Egyptians, Kushites, Libyans, Asiatics, and Greeks. Come on, let's go. After enjoying an amazing time at the site of ancient Akhetaten, which I showed you in the last episode, check it out if you haven't yet, my colleague in history, Natalie, and I, along with our guide, Ehab, and our driver, Muhammad, rested and refreshed at our hotel in Benisweif, headed towards the Fayum. Lying at the mouth of the oasis are the remains of two amazing pyramids from the Middle Kingdom, one at El Lahun that belonged to Senusret II, and another at Hawara that belonged to Amenemhat III. These don't get a lot of attention, but they are well worth seeing. The site of El Lahun, our first destination, has a pyramid with an underground network that has only been open to the public since 2019. So maybe this is why it's not on everyone's radar. Want to see what's inside? We'll let you ride along with us. El Lahun, or just plain Lahun, is the modern name of the town. Sometimes in old books in English, you will see it called Cahun. This is because the archaeologist Flinders Petrie misheard the name. When I first discovered the town in 1887, he said, I asked an old man whom I met what the name of it was. And he replied at once, Cahun, and so it has been since called. The ancient name of the site was probably Hetep Senusret, which means, may Senusret be at peace. It lies just north of the modern town. It is the largest surviving town site of the 12th dynasty. This is in the early 2nd millennium BCE. Keep in mind that this place was not only a town, but it was also a necropolis for the capital of Egypt during that period. We know from contemporary documents that the capital was called Ichtawi, but it has never yet been found. As far as ancient towns in Egypt go, Lahun is one of the better preserved. Although it was inhabited for a long time, there is in fact a cemetery dating to the first three dynasties on site. It reached the peak of its importance in the 12th dynasty because it was a royal necropolis for Senusret II. We get a good idea from its plan what a Middle Kingdom town was like. The purpose of the town at the time was to maintain the cult of the dead king, and it displays the features we would expect from a state-controlled construction project. It had a strict orthogonal grid of streets, and the architecture is laid out in a hierarchical fashion. Alahun costs 60 Egyptian pounds to enter, which translates to about two dollars U.S. You can still see the individual I bricks. I know. I was gonna. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. And they're still sitting there it's after incredible. all these thousands of years. It's amazing. Interestingly, the tomb complex made for King Senusret II is underneath the pyramid, not within it, and this is reminiscent of the one made for Djoser in the Third Dynasty, though that one was only a step pyramid. Senusret II decided to break with tradition by putting the entrance on the south side, which maybe was intended to fool would-be robbers. There are other tombs in the vicinity of the pyramid, and one of them, called Tomb Ten, has a shaft leading down to it. This is where we are going. We're going down into the tomb itself. By the way, guys, this is not the original gate of the Burmans. This is not the original uh, entranceway. It turns out that the shaft of Tomb 10 is a way to access the pyramid chambers. It also appears to have been the only route by which the sarcophagus of Senusret and large stone blocks used in the king's burial chamber 
could have been brought into the pyramid. At this side, you can see this is one of the original blocks, and it will be another, another one here. Two block here. Okay. To close the area. Very precarious. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no danger, it's there's no adventure. <laughs> Maybe Tomb Town was made to deflect robbers, but ultimately it didn't work because they figured it out and were able to access the pyramid through the floor of Tomb Town. It's a bit wet. It's like it's damp. It's not wet. It's, uh, moist. it's, it's a bit moist. beachy. Yeah. Some people think that Tomb Town was made later, along with three other shaft tombs, in the reign of Amenemet III who restored his predecessor's tomb after it had been robbed and added tomb 10 to throw future robbers off. This is called the Fraser Shaft. Flinders Petrie interpreted it as a way for the workmen to get in and out while the large stonework was being brought in through the main tunnel. And you can see everything like the clean or anything they move from here, they move it from this shaft here. You're talking about in, in, in ancient Egypt? In, no, in, uh, in uh, recent. Oh, re oh, to get everything out. To get out. everything out. I see. It was in his report, Petrie says that while archaeological work was being conducted here, a young boy accidentally fell into the shaft and was killed. I move them here. Yeah, you can feel the temperature change. The, the model, also, when you go, why we say that it's a chamber? Because yeah. it looks it look exactly this. We were like, oh, sorry, we just struck with that. Accidentally. They're vampire bats. Yeah, accidentally. It's <laughs> quickly done. Yeah. This is the barrier chamber. And this coffin, oh, yes. this coffin is? is totally different than any coffin that you're gonna see. This is like this, a movie set. It's gonna be like a little bit angled down. Look at that beautiful arched ceiling. As far as I know, it's the only one like it from dynastic Egypt. This is the most important part of the pyramid, the sepulcher itself. It's made out of pink granite. Now the walls are not uh, polished or ground, but they are fairly smooth. Uh, and you'll see there's a granite floor. Under the granite floor, there's a layer of sand, and then it goes to the marl uh, rock, which is a natural rock. And then here you have the ceiling also made of granite. Now only the uh, side that you can see has been uh, dressed, uh, the other sides, uh, probably rough, you know, on the top side. Notice the doors, I have beveled edges. That's pretty cool. Um, this was robbed in antiquity, this uh, chamber, but there was found here by Flinders Petrie a, an offering table made out of alabaster, and it had the name of Senerset on it. So here is the sarcophagus, and one of the first things you noticed about it, probably, is the angle, right? But even though the top angle is slanted, the bottom is straight. See, it was designed to be this way. For what reasons, we don't know, but I would think that the higher side would be where the head of Senruset would have been laid in the sarcophagus. And this wide lip here is very unusual. This is not common in sarcophagi. The inside of the sarcophagus has a flat surface as well. So this is flat, but the top here slopes down by about four inches. With a thread and plumb line, Flinders Petrie measured the straightness of the lines here, how, how, how much they veered off a straight line. And he found that they were accurate to within seven thousandths of an inch. He also measured the proportions of a sarcophagus and found that they used a cubit that was only off in its measurements uh, varied by about one hundredth of an inch. So this tells you that the stonemasons of ancient Egypt were very good at getting things just right. Look at this beautiful beveled edge. It's like what you might find in a modern kitchen countertop today. If you feel the surface with your hand, you'll find that it's very smooth. Now this was ground to a smooth finish, but it wasn't actually polished. Like this is not, this is not ground. This is smooth ground, but not polished. Yeah, yeah. In 1920, Flinders Petrie found a gold uraeus belonging to Senerset II's crown here, and this is one of the main ways he identified the king who was buried here. 
There is no lid to the sarcophagus anywhere here, not even a broken piece. This, coupled with the fact that there are no scratches on the top lip of the sarcophagus, which there certainly would be if robbers had to pry a lid off, suggests it never had a lid. So these be all, these, this would have been where all of his treasures would have been placed. One mystery about the subterranean complex under the pyramid is that, very clearly, its passages and rooms were never completed. And yet, the complex above ground was. Why did they finish the exterior, but not the interior? You'd think the interior would have been done first. This brought us back to the uh, sepulchre, but notice here, this is um, the granite that was used for the ceiling, right, and the wall, actually for the wall, all right, but this is how we know that this, the granite was dressed on the part that you saw, but it's rough on the parts that you don't see. Uh, here you can see the wall, and here's a, a stone block that's not quite all the way in the wall. They still had yet to push it all the way in. Lahoon was first excavated between 1889 and 1899, and found here at the time was the largest collection of Middle Kingdom papyri ever found. All kinds of fascinating documents were in it, mostly business papers for the cult of the king, but other writings as well. What are particularly fascinating are the hymns that were composed for Senusret III, Senusret II's grandson, when he was king. They give us a glimpse into the beliefs the Egyptians of this time had about their kings. These hymns could have been sung when Senesret III visited Lahun, when a statue of his father was installed here at Lahun, during ceremonies dedicated to the king when he was alive or when he was dead. Hail Kakara, our Horus, divine of forms, protector of the land, extender of its boundaries, he who defeats foreign lands by his great crown. He who embraces the two lands with his action. He who grasps the foreign lands with his two arms. Who slaughters the bowman without a blow of a weapon. Who fires the arrow without the string being drawn. He whose dread has smitten the nomads in their land. He whose fear slaughters the nine bows. Whose massacre causes the death of thousands of bowmen who had dared to reach his border. He who fires an arrow as Sekhmet does. He fells thousands of those unaware of his power. The tongue of his person is the restraint on the bowland, and his commands are what set the nomads to flight. Unique and youthful one who fights at his border, who never lets his workers grow weary, who enables the nobles sleep to daybreak. With his troops in their sleep, his heart is their protector. His decrees have drawn up his borders. His words have assembled the two riverbanks. I took a walk around the pyramid to check out the north side, where there is a set of eight mastabas used for members of the royal family. What is interesting about these mastabas is that instead of their being made in the traditional manner, out of bricks, they were carved right out of the natural limestone bedrock and only faced with bricks. One tomb on the east side 
was formed into a little pyramid for Senusret's queen. You can see a lot of holes in them. These were dug out by Petri. He never did find much inside the tombs, though. They all had been plundered long ago. This looks very similar to the uh, kind of uh, uh, weathering you see on the uh, enclosure to the Sphinx uh, at Giza. Um, but these are, of course, um, Mastaba tombs from the Middle Kingdom. Next, we drove a little ways further west to the site of Hawara, where the pyramid of Amenemhat III can be found. He ruled two generations after Senusret II. Have you ever heard of the lost labyrinth of Egypt? Well, our ancient sources tell us it was located at Hawara. I'll show you what we found there. The entrance fee for Hawara also is 60 Egyptian pounds. The pyramid enclosure is the largest of the Middle Kingdom enclosures, and it is oriented north-south, like old Djoser's pyramid complex, which we showed you in an earlier episode. I, w I don't know if this is the king or not, but it could very well be, and there's a necklace around his neck. You can see he's kind of buff, too. <laughs> yeah, isn't that cool? You're there. Kind of cool, the face was knocked off. This is like an intact vessel. Look at this. Look at this intact vessel here. No. So. This is a queen over here. Tina's sheath or something, but. But maybe not. Maybe it's the queen on the right. We're not entirely certain what this pyramid complex was called, but some rock inscriptions found at the Wadi Hamamat reference statues that were being made for a structure called. Amenemhat Ankh, who always and forever lives in the house of the Fayum, Sobek. This could be the name of this place. Sobek, in case you don't know, was a crocodile god from this area. It looks like there's another similar complex or something. Yeah, there's a temple probably there. Yeah. yeah. So, so is there an entrance to go inside this pyramid? There or? is, but it goes okay. down underwater. Oh, uh, that's right. This is the water yeah. one for me. Oh, that's the labyrinth. The labyrinth. Okay. Amenemhat III had two pyramids. One was one we call the Black Pyramid over at Dasher. And then we have here his second pyramid, the pyramid that we think he was interred in, uh, the Black Pyramid here at Hawara. Uh, as you can see, you're mostly looking at mud brick. It had a mud brick core with a limestone outer casing. But of course, the limestone has been pillaged over the years for people to take and use for other building projects. And now it looks just like a mud brick mountain. Amenemhat III built this pyramid at a lower angle than his first one. And this may have been to avoid the collapse his first one experienced. This small limestone pyramid found by Petri, too small to be a pyramidian, he believed to be a model of this pyramid, perhaps used in the designing stage. All of this here is where the labyrinth once stood. It's all that's left of it, as far as we know. 
The extraordinary architectural wonder, known in Hellenistic and Roman times as the Labyrinth, sat on the west side of the complex. It is sometimes identified as the Mortuary Temple. But if true, it was the greatest mortuary temple ever built. People came from all over the Mediterranean world to marvel at it. Frustratingly, there's almost nothing left of it. In Roman times, it began to be quarried for stone and used for other buildings. Although it was called the Labyrinth, don't start imagining that it was full of blind corridors like a maze. Yes, it was large enough to get lost in, but it was never designed for that purpose. We get most of our descriptions from classical authors, and unfortunately, their testimonies are inconsistent. The Roman author Strabo said it was a palace composed of many smaller palaces, which suggests it consisted of a bunch of small courts and shrines. Herodotus says when he visited here, the priest told him there were a bunch of rooms below ground. And this has led many to believe there's still something under the sand here. But Petrie dug a ways down and could not find anything. I did a fuller discussion of the possibility of an underground complex in another video, which I will link for you below. But let me tell you about an amazing discovery that Petrie made, which he did not expect to make. He found a collection of papyri from Roman times the 1st and 2nd centuries CE to be precise, including parts of the Iliad. And north of the pyramid, he discovered a huge Roman cemetery and recovered there 146 painted portraits, the famous Fayum mummy portraits. At the time, he wasn't all that interested in the Roman stuff, but I certainly am. I mean, look at these. We are looking right into the faces of the Roman period Egyptians. Yeah, there's a, it's all water down there, so you can no longer get in the tomb. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, if only we could see the burial chamber. Descriptions of it say it was innovative and a technical marvel. They carved it in the shape of a rectangular tub from a single piece of stone, apparently sandstone or quartzite, which Petrie estimated to weigh 110 tons, and then a roof was placed over the top. The king's sarcophagus was made of quartzite, there was a smaller sarcophagus in there, too. In the antechamber, Petrie found an elaborately carved alabaster offering table and other objects, some of which had the name of the princess Neferupta on them. This made some people suppose that she had been put in the other sarcophagus, but then later the tomb of Neferupta was found southeast of here. We saw her granite sarcophagus in the Egyptian museum. Afterwards, we sat down with the guards and they made us some Egyptian tea. Yeah, like in kindergarten, everyone would give someone a card, and then as the years went on, it was sparser. We then headed back to Alexandria, where our adventure began. In Alexandria, or Alex as the locals call it, we decided to have dinner at a Greek seafood restaurant on the water called White and Blue. It was on the higher end as far as prices go, 
But that's in Egypt, so it still was very reasonable. We met up with our friend Alicia and enjoyed sitting near the water, having good conversation and good food. You know, Alexandria often gets overlooked because everyone that goes to Egypt goes to Cairo or Luxor. But when it comes to ancient history, Alexandria has something to offer too. And in the next episode, we are going to share with you some of the amazing ancient marvels we found. So don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned.